I'm Carol, Carol Driscoll, and I'm the executive director here. And our guests tonight are Evan Morris and Taylor Apostle. Both have participa participated in the sculpture programs at the Carving Studio and Sculpture Center for nearly a decade um, as instructors, artists in residence, and um, as exhibitors in our gallery. Uh, Evan is uh, originally from Boston. Uh, he graduated from Wheaton College and also did his um, master's degree at Boston University. Um, he has studied in uh, Florence and in Carrara specifically to learn techniques. I'm not like I'm hardly ever aware of them. Just a little bit of housekeeping, please mute. Not just like driving here was my vision. Yeah, it just felt weird. Yeah, vision. Okay. Um, sorry about that. I think I think it's like Mark. I can't do that, can I? I think maybe whoever is the host can. Um... Yeah, I just muted him. Sorry. Okay. Great. Thank you. <laughs> um. I was talking about Evan and the fact that after school, he went to um, Italy to study in Florence and in Carrara, learning techniques of stone carving from the masters over there. Um, in 2018, he won an Elizabeth Green Shields Foundation grant, which is very prestigious and allowed him to continue developing his work. Uh, he also uh, received a fellowship from the Massachusetts Cultural Council. And um, in 2018, the Dexter Jones Award for, from the National Sculpture Society for his relief sculpture. Um, he most recently won the 2020 Blanche Coleman Award. Uh, he is based in Newton and um, spends time and, in Italy and in um, Vermont with us at the Carving Studio. Evan's wife, Taylor Apostle, spent her formative years living in Saudi Arabia, the Philippines, and the suburb suburbs of, of Philadelphia. Uh, she uh, got her, her um, BA in studio art at the University of Vermont and then went on to do her master's in sculpture at Boston University. Um, she also studied marble car carving in Florence and Carrara, Italy, and has done residencies at the, at the studios at Mass Mocha, and is in permanent collections at the Howard, Howard Gottlieb Archivals Research Center, Hotel Commonwealth in Boston, Mass, and CS International University in Xinjiang, China. She lives with her husband and works in Newton, Mass. So um, we are ready to start with Evan. Serena, can you share the screen? I, we were, okay, we were planning on Taylor going first, but I will happily go first. Oh, I'm sorry. This okay, mine, be... mine's just got to be a little bit longer, but... No, no, no. I think we can switch over, can we? No, no, it's okay. Just go ahead. All right, <laughs> I'll start. No, 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 no. Okay. Serena, Serena has both of them um, available, so... Yeah, I have both of them up, so I can just quickly switch. That was my error. We did plan on Taylor first. <laughs> There we go. Right. Yeah, thank you. Thank yeah. you to everyone for coming. Yeah, first of thank all. you, everyone. It's good to see everyone. Um, and thank you, Carol, for the introduction. So, tonight I'm going to talk about three different bodies of recent work. Um, I'm going to start with the marble sculpture, um, a body of work that I've been. Uh, developing and still adding to, um, and as if we could advance, please. <laughs> Thanks. Um, 
So the first sculpture, um, this one is called Tangled Hair and it's about 27 tall by 24 by 10 inches and it's Carrara marble and I painted it with acrylic ink. Um, so side by side, you can see an in-progress shot um, with some tools and the lovely outdoor workspace is in Carrara when we were there in 2019. And we get to work at this really cool studio uh, called Ponce de Ferro, and that means Iron Bridge. And it's cool because it's a historic site, a very historic bridge where the marble, back when they used the train to transport it, um, it would go across that bridge and down to the port and out to the world. Um, so in this first body of work, um, it's combining um, hair-like carving. Uh, and so the, the background with it is a sort of like hair and memory. And um, I like to combine like a sort of rigid form, like you can see a wooden plank going horizontally through the tangled hair mass. Um, go ahead one more, please. Thanks. Um, so another in progress shot. And um, so with this series, I've been thinking a lot about um, how hair holds memory and actually like can hold and indicate stress levels. Um, so like cortisol can be measured and um, thinking about how these memories get tangled and blurred and changed and how you know, everyone has it and it's constantly growing and shifting. Um, go ahead one more, please. So first, like before I get too deep into any other sculptures, I wanted to talk a little bit about color and why I use color with marble. Um, so I often get a lot of questions about why I would wanna paint such a beautiful pure white surface. Um, so for me, about five or six years ago, I started experimenting with color on my sculptures and specifically on stone. And at first I was trying all sorts of non-traditional things like olive oil and lipstick and anything I could get my hands on. But I realized that those things weren't really stable and lights like UV safe. Um, so I started to play around more with pigment and I found that ink works incredibly well and it has a lot of, um, it's UV safe and once it's dry, it's permanent. So it doesn't wash off or change. Um, so this is just me experimenting with color for that first piece and um, just getting the, the colorings right. Um, so if you could go ahead one more, thanks. Um, so anytime uh, we go to museums or there's exhibitions, it's becoming more and more common to see uh, exi little exhibits specifically about the patinas on sculpture. Um, and so having taken art, art history courses throughout uh, school, you know, it's common knowledge that a lot of the ancient Greek and Roman sculptures that we love so much were all polychrome, um, which is super cool. So I love reminding people uh, when they look at my work that, you know, that I'm not doing anything particularly new. I'm actually doing something kind of old. Um, but I love to keep track of, you know, the very traditional kinds of pigments and methods in which um, marble sculpture was patinated. Um, let me go ahead. Uh, the other thing that I love doing with my work is using metal leaf and, um, here are just some traditional implements for doing metal leaf. Uh, you have like the boar hair bristle brushes at the bottom and the palette at the top with the gold leaf ready to be cut up and the little rubbing, the burnishing tools down on the right. Um, go ahead one more, thanks. Um, so again, continuing the hair and memory series, this is the other sculpture that I carved while we were in Carrara. So you can see the same nice outdoor studio, um, which for me, I, I really love being able to carve outside, um, even though there's you know, all of the elements 
uh, rain and all that, but it really is a, a great place to just experiment and make new work. So this piece is, um, let's see, I called it falling in, falling out. And so if we advance to the next one, please. Thanks. And um, the side, well, you actually oh, can yeah, see the, the sizes size, because of yeah. the working photos, I guess. Um, so this one is, let's see, I, I'm trying really hard to give titles and dimensions with this talk because I often forget because I know them so well. Um, so this one's about 18 inches tall by 20 by 14. Um, and so again, playing with the hair tangled up and memories that are sort of shifting and changing over time as there's these two binding elements, one at the top and then one around the middle, they're holding these kind of chopped up slivers and trying to pull them together while they're trying to kind of fall apart and shift and move around. Um, oh, that's good. That's good. Next one. Thanks. Um, so this one is called Hair and Tunnels. And one of the earliest of the hair-based hair and memory um, sculptures. And again, when I was like doing some different sort of very experimental with like what would give me some really saturated color. Um, so this one is 12 inches tall by 20 by 13. And this was one of the first sculptures that I was playing with flock, which I don't know if any anyone is familiar with what flock is. Uh, it's really tiny nylon fibers um, and you get a matching adhesive and you have, there's different ways to apply it, but the simplest way is like two cardboard tubes with holes in the top and you kind of just shoot it on to the surface and let it dry a really long time. And then it's, it creates this kind of velvety surface and maybe you've seen like the inside of a box lined with it. Um, but once I found it, I really fell in love with that material because it's, again, you can get a version that's light safe and weatherproof. And I've even tested it. There's a piece of stone that I threw out into the garden and uh, left it out there for several New England winters and summers and you can scrub it and hose it off. Um, so in terms of like archival uh, business, it works very well for that. Um, so this one, the yellow, is the kind of flocked area. And go ahead one more, please. Thanks. So on the opposite side, you can kind of see more of the tunnel action. Um, and with this piece is remembering the kind of movement and flow and sort of shifts of light. And I was being really kind of, um, like I said, much more experimental with using, I think I used pigment. Uh, like loose pigment and ink and acrylic. And I have a list here, wax and wax markers and kind of really playing around with how to get that super saturated intense kind of color and then grinding it off. So I think that's another thing that I found interesting with uh, marble sculpture and using color is that um, a lot of times people are trying to keep if they want to keep it pure and white, they um, are very worried about stains, but I found with this you can actually erase and go back and it's been a fun process uh, going through that. And one more working photo so you can kind of see, and that's at the carving studio, uh, another great place to do outdoor sculpture work. And on the right, like slowly building up with pigment, but I couldn't really get the intensity that I was hoping for. Um, and another one in the Hair and Memory series, and this one is called On the Border. And you can see on, oh, and it's eight by 18 by 11 inches. And again, marble. Um, and you can see on the right, the working photo, and this is actually our at home workspace. We have a great little place under the garage. Um, so no windows, no uh, big outdoor uh, space to work in, but still very cozy kind of everything you need to do smaller work. Um, 
And again, you can get an idea of the scale if you're familiar with the, the tools there. So with this piece, um, get advanced one more. Thanks. Um, here's a couple of different views and you can get a little bit of an idea of how this big massive hair is kind of sitting on two, again, pieces of wood and it's kind of pulling itself apart and swirling around. And with the, the title um, the on the border, so I was thinking a lot about how we have a lot of borders and things are divided and we, within our memories and within our sort of compartmentalization of things in our lives, like how, how things are tangled and how things become separated and pulled apart. And also the literal, like how, if you have a bit of a dusty house or hair is gathering or, and it kind of tends to get pushed. So things that get pushed to the edge, pushed to the side and the border. Um, and with this one, again, I was still in the more experimental phase of using um, all sorts of colored waxes and pigments and really trying to like work as much saturation into it as possible. And this is the, I think this is the final one in the Hair and Memory series that I picked for the talk. Um, this one is called Catcher. And it's about 11 tall by 16 by 16 inches. Again, it's marble and the purplish color is the ink and the metal leaf is the golden color. Go ahead. Um, and here's, I have more photos of Catcher, so I'll talk a little bit more about it. But again, our little workspace under the garage. Um, and then again, the early stages of working on it. Uh, so another view. Um, and again, I guess I should talk about, so in marble for me, I do what's called direct carving, um, where I don't set out with like a scale model or anything like that. I usually do sketches to keep track of ideas. And then um, from that, I like to, I don't let the stone dictate. I, I definitely, um, I know that a lot of stone sculptors do that where they see something within the stone. But for me, I'm I'm approaching it with a, a very specific um, idea that I want to pursue. And then I change the stone um, to have that. So with my way of direct carving, I'm also considering the way, like talking again about the way that um, for humans with memories, like they don't, they're unreliable, they're shifting, they're constantly changing. Um, and so I do allow a little bit of looseness um, in terms of the carving and the form that I go for in the end. And so with this one, again, thinking about the idea of um, capturing and release and how in the literal sense, like hair again, captures memory and back to the, the cortisol and the stress levels and how that can be read and um, uh, to indicate like, health issues and even, um, yeah, all sorts of information can be drawn from hair and then in a sort of more dreamlike way, just thinking of like this sort of dream catcher, like transformative thing. <laughs> um, so we could advance, please, thanks. And so I wanted there to be a lot of flowing movement with the hair and to give this kind of sense of this object that's shifting and moving, although it's in stone, so it obviously can't really change. It's not an ephemeral thing. It's a very rigid, um, very rigid material. So. Also see. one thing about Taylor's <laughs> work also, um, which she was kind of talking about with the direct carving. Um, a lot of people, when they're carving marble, want to get to a really finished, polished or honed surface. And um, like the color, Taylor kind of rebukes that and leaves a lot of tool marks and a lot of texture on the surface, which is a very different way of working than a lot of people. That's good. I mean, <laughs> yeah, it is very intentional. I realize that maybe, yeah, and again, with, like Evan said, with 
very traditional approaches to stone is there's this idea of like the perfect surface and the perfect polish. And I definitely did, when I first started, I was definitely in that mindset. Um, but I, again, with the color, as I quickly realized, like, I love working with marble because it has such a range of textures that you can get and surfaces. And I also, um, I think about this a lot is like, how do you know when the piece is done? So if you're doing something abstract and the concept is abstract and like, when, when does that end? And I was thinking about that even today, right before the talk. And for me, I'm, I'm definitely after like a little bit of beauty and a little bit of like sort of a nice sense of balance within the piece, but also in the end, I realize I really want um, people who see it to want to touch it and to like have this sort of like a uh, visceral reaction to it, even if they can't touch it um, and to have it be an object that is familiar. So like really referencing um, an everyday object even and that you might not really know what it is at first, but that it then leads to like a slower reading of the sculpture and it takes a little bit more time to figure out what you're looking at. Um, yeah, I think, I think that's all I wanted to say about that. All right, so this is the second, um, like I mentioned in the beginning that there'll be three different sort of bodies of work. So this past summer, uh, it was August and September, um, I participated in this really cool event called the Nashua International Sculpture Symposium and it's held in Nashua, New Hampshire. And just a little bit about the event to begin with. Um, they usually, it's called the International Symposium, but last year they actually invited, um, they ended up only having sort of regional or national artists come, of course, because of border restrictions. Um, <laughs> So I was fortunate to be able to attend and- Well, you were supposed to attend. Yeah, I was supposed to, <laughs> I was supposed to do it a year before too. Um, but yeah, so international, usually they invite two international artists and one, you know, regional or national sculptor to come and you live with a host family and you're fed by the community and it's this incredible sort of, um, incredibly generous and wonderful uh, three weeks. And so the and other- the, the, the city of Nashua is just filled with all these sculptures. Oh yeah, now. it's incredible. I think, I mean, they have, I think it's close to 40. It's definitely more than 30 sculptures sited all around the city. Um, and the site for this year was this incredible, I think it's like a nine mile long park right in the, right in the city and, um, this year, that was our location. And again, what was different about this year is they wanted to have it be a little bit more collaborative. So the three artists, um, the other artists, Elijah and Kelly, um, we actually did Zoom meetings uh, leading up to the event and did a little bit of sort of, you know, brainstorming and trying to think since all three of our uh, works that were created um, are all in the same sort of area of this one, it's like a raised up little hill in the park. And so they, we were trying to figure out how to still be individuals and make the work we wanted to make, but also to be making something that related to each other and to very specifically to the site. And so now I'll talk more about um, the sculptures that I made. So I made three gigantic marble pine cone like forms and they're called soft cones. And I used the flock, so that's what the bright orange color is on the tips. Um, and the cones are, they're about, the biggest one is 42 by 16 by 15, just to give you a little idea. And there are more photos with um, people in them. <laughs> Thanks. Um, so my, my thought, we visited the site several times and we actually, so showing up to the symposium normally with a, a stone or a sculpture symposium is you'd show up, you would have submitted a model, they would have approved the model, it would be to scale and you would just get right to work. And so this was again, very different model for um, 
doing a symposium and super short time frame, three weeks to make monumental work is, it's super fast. Um, so visiting this site, I just, I became really fascinated by the pine cones and this wonderful, you know, patch of the park that we were going to be able to um, have an intervention with. And I realized I wanted to make something uh, literally grounded and something solid, but also soft and knowing with public art is, you know, people are going to touch it. And again, like I said earlier, I actually hope for people, like I, I want that sort of reaction that you want to touch um, the work. So I made, I kept, you know, looking at the pine cones and thinking like, for me, I don't, I don't really um, want to directly copy anything. So I took a loose sort of, you know, copying the spirals, but giving them a, a very sort of softness and focusing on um, I guess we could, we could look at some of the other ones. <laughs> Thanks. Um, so here's a, a second one and another view of it. So this one's a much more tightly closed cone. And yeah, here's a little bit of the, the working on them. So the work site was right out front of the, I believe it's called the Picker Artists co-op building and it was a great space and the public could come and they could ask us questions and watch us work. A couple more. And so this is me flocking in a tent. So the really, really tricky thing about flock is it's just loose fiber. So it goes everywhere and a little bit of wind would just like blow it all away and you kind of need it to sit on the surface for like 12 hours or so before it's really cured. So luckily there were, um, Gail, the director had bought these tents for us to, you know, get out of the sun or work in and they all had, and they had four sides total. And so I zipped myself in and, you know, this is like September, so it's like super hot and I'm zipped inside the tent, just flocking and hoping that it, you know, sticks enough. <laughs> oh. So this is the, the third cone, and this one's about um, 32 by 15 by 10. Um, so again, back to the sort of form, as I wanted to show them in the, like, the different states of opening and closing. And so I you know, did a bunch of research on eastern white pine cones, and you know, it's a very, very common uh, tree. And especially in that park, it was just full of them. So I did want to kind of capture that uh, that aspect of the park and how important they are. Um, so when they're drier, they're more closed and when they're wet, they're more open. Um, wait, I feel like I got that backwards. <laughs> I might have gotten that backwards. So anyways, when the cones um, are more open, <laughs> they release the seed and the seed travels on the wind so then it would make more sense if it was the opposite. Anyways, I did do the research and <laughs> found them fascinating. And then for me, it was really important that for the installation, my the cones point to the other sculptures. Um, I didn't include photos of the other sculptures, but you can look it up or you can go visit the park, which I highly recommend, and go on the sculpture walk in Nashua. So they basically, there's this one is at the far end of the site and it points down the hill. And then the, the second one that we saw points up the hill. And then the big one is right in the middle. So it kind of makes this triangle with the other work. Um, and again, it was really uh, satisfying even as we were installing them that day, people were, you know, it's a very well trafficked park and people were coming by and petting them and, you know, unprompted and it was sort of what I would hope for <laughs> with the sculptures is that, you know, maybe they get a lot of interaction. And again, like citing them, I think it's really tricky with public art and getting um, things cited without having the, the base be intrusive to the sculpture. And so fortunately, Jim, the artistic director, was great at splitting boulders and he just split a bunch of boulders and buried them in the ground and 
So that's how they're pinned because the, the boulders are sunk in. So they're very sturdy. Um, yeah, all right. So now the final body of work that I'll talk about, and this is the, <clears throat> the work that I've been uh, doing most recently. And I've shifted over to clay, which um, we have a kiln now in the, and it's actually in the carving part of the studio. Uh, I actually started um, making sculpture like back in undergrad. It was, um, I was very into ceramics and even like functional pottery. Um, so this feels like being able to kind of go back to how it all started. And it's just a very different way of working than working stone. Um, so this series, um, I like to call winged pots and the, the other ones look more like literally winged vessels. Uh, but this first one is called um, List Maker. Again, it's clay and I've been painting them again with acrylic, much like the marble and this one wax and pencil. And strangely enough, so I started working on this, um, I think really, really early 2020 or 2019, late 2019. And I knew that I wanted to be working more with uh, vessel forms and clay and sort of thinking about not utilitarian, not strictly utilitarian forms, but things that look utilitarian, but just can't quite function. And again, continuing the theme with the hair. And this one has like actual kind of like clay grocery lists going through them. And so this sort of like obsessive list making and keeping track of things and almost like these things coming out of your hair. Um, and so it became really bizarre when, you know, a little bit later in 2020, it became so uh, important to go to the grocery store and have your, your things in order. And so it was sort of like a weird uh, timing thing with that. Um, so, go ahead. so another of the winged pots and this one sort of, I'm, I've been referring to it as a mail bin um, and it's actual uh, mail bin or recycle bin size, about 12 inches tall, 19 by eight. Um, and again, clay, acrylic and wax. And I've been doing um, some rubbings of actual envelopes and other paper items. Um, yeah, there's a close up, you can kind of see. This one is like tax letters. So again, these kind of bits of paper that I mean, it's less and less common to be dealing with these little bits of paper. And so I kind of wanted to make this historical reference and have a little bit of fun with um, so like utilitarian, utilitarian bins, but like who would ever use this uh, kind of. Um, again, uh, another one of the winged pots. This one's a little bit smaller. It's about 11 by 14 by eight. And it's a camo flocked surface. So again, I wanted to like have some of the bins be dreamlike and strange and, um, and this one's velvety soft. And uh, again, like CVS coupons, I don't know. If you shop at CVS, you know the deal with CVS coupons. <laughs> They're just constantly coming at you. Um, and again, it's kind of, sort of commemorating this strange little bit of paper that Part of our lives. And here's a little bit of the behind the scenes of flocking. So each color had to be done individually and then left to cure and sort of a strange process. So another, another one of the CVS bins, this one's a little bit bigger. Um, by going too slow. So yeah, and this one's a work in progress and installation. Um, I think there's just one more. And this is just what I've been working on now. It's uh, another winged pot. I think there's just, yeah. So you might recognize this form and with its wings. <laughs> All right. Great. 
How are we doing on time, Carol? Does it have to at a certain time? Yeah, we've got um, 20 minutes before eight, 22 minutes before eight. So thank you, Taylor, that was wonderful. Thank you. Are we doing questions afterwards or? Yes. Okay. Will it, um, it doesn't like time out, does it, when it gets to eight or? No, no, no. Okay, all right. Well, we'll try to aim, aim for about that. <laughs> okay, so I'm Evan. Um, this is also recent work for me. Um, the earliest stuff is from 2017 and it's a kind of a selection. And I'm interested in figurative sculpture um, and its associations with art of the past and uh, its ability to tell a narrative. Um, and so I'm just gonna say a few things to get them out of the way that I can come back to when I go on. <laughs> um, I'm also interested in irony and humor and using that to uh, kind of hint at a, a deeper meaning um, and an underlying idea that isn't necessarily obvious. And I don't always know um, why I'm doing exactly what I'm doing, but, um, and I feel like maybe I often try to ascribe um, more meaning to it than uh, is initially there when I start the work. Um, so you can make your own interpretations, but doing artist statements and artist talks like this help me try to figure out for myself uh, better what my own motivations are um, and inspirations are to make my work. So we'll start with the next slide, please. So um, starting with a series of work that was um, based on these early, early Renaissance reliefs uh, by Andrea Pisano, which are on the Campanile of, um, in Florence, which is the bell tower. Um, as you may have picked up, we both studied abroad in Florence. Uh, so we got to live, Taylor lived there for two semesters. So I got to live there for three months. And it was amazing to see all the art and sculpture just around you on the streets everywhere. And so I, I would have walked or biked by these every day, multiple times. Um, but I didn't actually notice them until uh, years later um, when I saw them in the Duomo Museum in Florence. Um, and I liked the, um, something about like the, the hexagon struck me. And also since they're like early goth, uh, early Renaissance, almost Gothic, um, the, Andrea Pisano was just starting to play with um, some perspective and different rendering of the human form. And so they're like a little bit, um, they're very interesting, like the way the sheep in this one are kind of recessed. It's a, it's a weird thing. Um, so anyways, um, this piece of the dog walker, mine are a little bit smaller than the originals. This is about 18 by 16 by two inches deep. Um, I probably wasn't looking at the sheep one while I, when I first did it, I was just doing a series of everyday uh, scenes but I was thinking with the dog one about, um, so the everyday scenes like are partly honoring the, the commonplace, but then uh, putting them and referencing this, uh, this Renaissance, this biblical um, reference, puts it, casts it in a different light and also doing it in the uh, medium of sculpture. And, um, and so I'm, I'm trying to put a twist on it and it's like partly honoring uh, the everyday, but then also um, making you th think like about perhaps if I had to make a political message with this one, our relationship with animals and how we used to, you know, on the one side is animal husbandry, the beginning of sheep herding, and the other, other side is like our current relationship with pets, et cetera. So I'll move. I'm going too slow, <laughs> a lot of slides. Um, so another similar one, this one, I definitely was looking at the uh, drunkenness of Noah um, and doing a kind of similar Bacchanalian scene with the beer pong. I have anything else to say about that. Um, no, we can, we can advance. Um, and this one, I, I wasn't thinking about uh, Daedalus and the mechanical arts, but if I had to draw uh, a comparison, um, Daedalus is the father of Icarus, who of course uh, crashed down because um, he flew too close to the sun. And here we have a similar 
comparison where we have this great technology, but then we're, get, we're getting um, kind of screwed over by it with traffic and pollution, et cetera. And this one, um, the one on the right is from, as you can see, uh, Chapel in Paris, another uh, relief from the Genesis series. And mine is Landscapers Around West Newton, which if you have <laughs> lived in West Newton or a suburb, you're probably familiar with Landscapers. And um, I think it's, it's kind of sad. I mean, it's, I'm kind of, again, slightly honoring the everyday, but also there is for me an underlying political message, which I'm not necessarily expecting people to pick up on, um, but I'm thinking about how we no longer have um, quite the same relationship with the earth as we used to. And in fact, we're um, creating pollution and uh, using water just to grow grass in our lawns. So the one on, uh, so the Bank of America ATM could be kind of an altar to wealth. And the other one is um, Carriage Road Comav. So it's just uh, people exercising. And this is a supermarket checkout and a garbage truck. So I'm thinking about our relationship with um, you know, where does food come from? For most of us, we just buy it at the supermarket. We don't farm it. And then where does our waste go? Um, trash, we just put in the garbage and the garbage truck takes it away and it's out of sight, out of mind. So there's a little bit of irony in um, honoring these things. Um, in Bologna, Italy, the, the relief on the right, there are tons and tons of these uh, reliefs showing students around Bologna. Uh, because Bologna was known for its university at a certain point in time. And I really loved these images and how each face had its own different characteristics. And I so did my own version of students. I think that's the last of those. So you can see some of them together. These are all, um, mine are all modeled in clay and then cast in plaster. And these are the actual um, Pisano reliefs on the Campanile. That's pretty interesting. Hmm. So uh, from Florence to Carrara, um, Carrara, as Taylor was talking about, is um, known for its marble. And we've been there several times to make use of that. And around Carrara, they have all these little votive uh, reliefs just stuck in the walls here and there, um, clearly as blessings or devotionals for the households. Um, but then, the, so I'll advance one slide, please. Um, so at, at times that's often at odds with the architecture that has kind of been <laughs> built up around them. So you have these beautiful reliefs that are a few hundred years old. The one on the, one's like above a garage. The other one on the right is was just in someone's uh, garden that we met from the 1700s. So, Advance, please. So I wanted to do, um, in the spirit of that, I, this was from 2017, 2018. Does that make sense? 2017, okay. Mm -hmm. um, I, I did a small relief and it's pretty obviously based on uh, two reliefs, one by Donatello, one by Michelangelo, the Madonna of the Clouds and Madonna of the Stairs. Next slide, please. Um, and this, um, I'm not gonna try to ascribe <laughs> any particular meaning to, except that I wanted to do something uh, beautiful in that spirit and try to copy the uh, very low relief style. You can see how small it is, about 12 inches tall. So, um, this is switching gears a little bit. So far, everything has been relief work, which I do love. Um, and this is from uh, another series of work that I call Idols. Um, this one's called Goddess of Light. And also inspired by 
most of my sculptures have this kind of, uh, I'm thinking of them in a, a religious context. Um, and so this one is obviously ironic because it's honoring the way we look at our phones. Um, next slide, please. And it was loosely inspired um, stylistically by, I don't know if this is one, I, I think this is a Hindu sculpture. I don't know where I saw it. It's just one of the sculpt, one of the photos I took of the many museums I went to. But there are these beautiful Hindu sculptures in the Worcester Art Museum. And I, I wanted to do something that would, had a central figure and it was very intricate around the sides. And um, with this one, instead of doing the um, an intricate network, I decided just to carve the marble very thin so that the light shines through. So if you go to the next slide, you can see in the back where I tried to go pretty, pretty thin with the marble. And I'm thinking about, with this one, I'm thinking about Again, the power of technology, because with these little devices, handheld devices, we have this ability to connect through light waves um, with people all over the world, similar to the way we are doing right now. Am I gesticulating too much? <laughs> um, but then, so we, you have this beautiful power of connection, but then the end result um, is often that you're hunched over looking at your device. Next, please. So on the other side of the screen, you might see um, something like this. Um, if you're looking at Instagram, uh, people posting photos of themselves in a um, self-advancing uh, kind of way. And obviously, this is obviously based on a, um, Egyptian sculptures and I'll go, go to the next slide, please. So these are some Egyptian sculptures from the MFA. Um, and with these, I, I just wanted to do, I was initially just thinking with about the form and wanting to copy uh, the basic form of it. Um, but I liked the fact that with Egyptian sculptures, like most art throughout history, it can be, um, could have been used as a form of propaganda just to to show the power or importance of, in this case, a king and queen. Um, and there's still a record of them thousands of years later. And we do a, kind of a similar thing with um, social media where you want to show your beauty and your importance. Um, and we have just a diff very different way of doing it now. We do it with technology. We do it with the internet and these cameras that we all carry around. And so by doing a more modern image in this very archaic mode of working. I'm trying to put a twist on that and look at it in a different light. Next, please. This one is another very obvious uh, reference to a Greek sculpture called the Apoxiomenos. Apoxiomenos. And he's using a strigil, which is a tool used to scrape dirt and sweat off his body. And I'd always had this desire to, to do one where he's using deodorant. Um, and at first it was just that, it's just a, a funny idea. But I like that um, most people don't know what a strigil is. You can show the next slide, please. Um, and you have to be, explain what it is. And it's, oh, what is that seems like a weird thing to do to take this metal tool and scrape your sweat off. Um, but we do, if you look out of context or from a different perspective, uh, what we do, we taking chemicals and putting it on our underarms to prevent sweating, which, you know, in a thousand or 2000 years might seem very strange to people uh, looking back at our time. Um, next, please. So this is about 30, 39 inches tall. And this is from 2020. And you can see me modeling it in clay on the right. And I cast it in plaster and painted it with acrylic paint. And I don't, for, for me, this was a, an excuse to work a little bit larger and to do a standing figure, which I, I think this is the, like the largest clay standing figure I've done. The other thing about it, one more thing, I guess, is like the, the relationship with the male nude, which um, 
in the Greek world was very commonplace. In effect, uh, the when a female nude uh, came out, that was like um, a little more controversial than the male nude. Whereas now it's, um, I guess, the other way around. You you're used to seeing female nudes, especially in art, and the male nude is not as common. So this would be one of the ones where I liked the form and I liked, and this is the, the, my, my piece here on the left called um, Madonna of the Cats. It isn't a, just based on this piece, it's based on a variety of uh, pieces I saw, but I wanted to do a standing female figure and I wanted to make her a type of saint and add these devices that are supposed to tell you um, about her. And if you know the story, like um, people would have known the story of this Madonna on the right at the time, then you know the meaning of the symbols. But my symbols, I just chose to be cats. So I'll advance, please. So she has a lion mask up top, um, a cat at her feet, and then a little toy cat in her box. And I wanted to do the, the weird box as a sort of reliquary just because I kept seeing them in sculptures and I liked that as a visual. Next, please. So, yeah. Okay, why don't we go back to that last one for a second. Okay, um, so this one, th I'll do the next one, please. This is, uh, I call a cow, uh, another saint type figure, um, not just based on this uh, one you see on the right, but um, I saw a lot of these little terracotta figures. It's about, the mine is about 27 inches tall. Um, and I wanted to do um, this kind of noble figure, and I, but I put him in a onesie, and I got one of the more ridiculous onesies I could find, which was this cow, and I thought it just seemed like such a, <laughs> such a distant, such a far cry from um, what an actual cow looks like. Go to the next, next please. And so it's silly, but again, I'm thinking about animals and our relationship with animals and nature. And here's this polyester onesie that you wear and you call yourself a cow. <laughs> That's silly. Next, please. You can see me working on it. And this is, um, this is water-based clay. This is terracotta. And I painted it and flocked it, taking a page out of Taylor's book. <laughs> This was, let's see, it's 7.55, okay. Um, I really liked this image, uh, this Etruscan Cinerarium uh, that I saw, it's at the RISD Museum. I didn't actually see the piece, I saw a photo of it. Um, and I'd been saving up this dog fur for an art project. And so I decided, okay, I'm gonna make not a reliquary for ashes, but a reliquary for dog fur. So um, I did it in terracotta, it's about, 15 by 15 by 10. Next, please. And the two sides are glass, so you can see the dog fur in the windows. And on the right is a reliquary with probably a, a saint's bone, which uh, were common at a certain point in time in Europe. Um, this as, dog is alive. Yes, this dog is alive. <laughs> most alive. But, I guess I was thinking about, you know, I'll leave this one up to you. <laughs> okay, next, please. <laughs> the lid comes off. You can add more, more fur to it. Hmm. I, I guess I was thinking about the, the transience of things and usually you just throw in the trash or like throw into the wind and uh, hanging on to the fur as a record of 
I don't, I don't know. Next. Um, these Greek altars are in the Getty Museum in LA and I saw them and loved them and they were used so they were used for small burnt offerings. And I wanted to do one and I decided to, the theme would be uh, water because I kept seeing these, well, there were a few inspirations. One um, was I kept seeing water bottles, empty plastic water bottles all over the neighborhood. Um, and so I started gathering those as a, for a reliquary. Um, and I, Okay, I'll go to the next slide. Um, so my altar is, is for, I tried burning the bottles, but it didn't work. Um, but to display it, I would pile up a bunch of water bottles on top. And it's again about waste and trash and thinking about water, which is a precious resource and um, the ways that we have to the ways that we get it. And uh, I mean, I'm against the use of plastic water bottles. I understand that in certain cir circumstances, you need to have plastic water bottles, but usually not in a suburban neighborhood. You could use a reusable water bottle, um, fill up from your tap. Next slide. Um, but so this relief that's on the altar was directly inspired, as you can see from uh, photos I took in Lucca, Italy of, I mean, all over Italy, they have these beautiful, again, art and fountains, and they use them. And so this is a public fountain, um, and people just kept walking over and filling up bottles and reusing them. And I thought that was great because you have the, um, you, can, you can advance, that's great. Um, the juxtaposition of the this beautiful uh, goddess-like figure and then real humans walking up and actually using the fountain for its intended purpose. Next. This one, I'm also thinking about stuff and our accumulation of stuff. It's terracotta, it's 22 inches high. And I, so she's sitting on a pile of just assorted things. So I call it Humanity contemplates her stuff. It's an allegory. <laughs> Next, please. Um, and this was just the, the, po the pose of the figure was uh, inspired by this Chinese bodhisattva that's in the Museum of, Museum of Fine Arts in Boston. And I just really like the pose and um, like the solemn quality of it. And so I wanted to contrast that solemn quality within this pile of trash or just random things that she's sitting on. Next. Okay, I have, I have two more pieces. <laughs> it's eight o'clock. Um, this one, I wasn't actually looking at this. This is a throwback to the initial series. Um, and I found this image of the Pisano relief um, as I was putting together the PowerPoint and liked that it um, worked with this piece, though I wasn't directly thinking about it when I made it. Um, this one, I was looking at all this construction that's going on in Newton and thinking about our relationship with our own habitat and with the earth and construction. And um, so there are a lot of magic elements Next, please. Yeah, and the form of the figure was uh, stylistically inspired by this Greek relief. So in the Greek relief, there's the dog and I, I made a robot dog and I relegated the bunny to the sewer drain. <laughs> and there's a, a drone holding the sun in the air. That's... Um, 42 inches tall. And so the only uh, vegetation uh, visible in the scene is a potted plant, which is very sad. <laughs> and my last piece, this is recent, this is from, I finished it in 2021. And it's uh, 27 by 39 by two inches. Um, 
and I want to do a formal relief in the style of uh, St. Gaudens portrait reliefs. Next, please. And I wasn't, and so the flip side is instead of this uh, stoic, stoic pose, it's uh, more of a tragic pose. And I wasn't sure why I was doing that to begin with. Um, but after, after I finished it, I can go to the next slide. I was, I was reminded of all these um, 18th century French marbles that I saw in the Louvre of all these Greek tragic male heroes. Next slide. Yeah. And so I was, I was rethinking about what maybe the relief meant um, in, the after, in the aftermath um, and maybe projecting more meaning onto it, but um, thinking about maybe it being uh, in the context of COVID about um, anxieties and having and being stuck at home and um, all the things that come with that. Next slide. That's the last one. Yeah, and so uh, I'll leave you with uh, Prometheus having his liver pecked out by an eagle, and you can consider for yourself in uh, in relation to my relief. <laughs> <laughs> Well, thank you everyone for coming. <laughs> I do have a couple of questions that were sent out, um, but if anybody has one beforehand, please speak up. Okay, are we allowed to just speak? Yes. Well, hello, Taylor and Evan. Hi, B. Hi, B. It was an absolutely <laughs> great presentation. It was wonderful. I totally love the way that you are so versed in classical ways of making sculpture and how you've adapted them to a modern context. And I think that's quite striking in both of your work. And I really just want to congratulate you. I think it's a very unusual way to use classical materials and very thoughtful. And I like the humor, but also the skill. You know, I, I think they're, it's, they're really quite striking. Makes me want to write about you. I took a lot of notes. And see. <laughs> yeah, really, really striking. And I thought the presentation was wonderful going back and forth between the classical works that inspired some of your pieces. Do you know what I mean? And the modern context. The last one of the father, it looks like the father is just completely overcome by the kids at home. <laughs> And I loved the, I loved the, um, the polychrome use, uh, Taylor, especially in your work um, on the marble. And it puts me back in mind of some of the experiments I did and some students. And ink was always the preferred, the preferred method, but the flocking was fascinating to see you with the air gun, do you know what I mean, and aiming it. So I look forward to more. I'm going to be down in Boston more often, so I might be able to visit you and you can visit me. <laughs> but congratulations, really excellent, excellent presentation, excellent work. Can't wait to see you back. <laughs> Thank you. Pamela, did you have, you sent a message? Did you have something to say about Taylor's? I gotta un yeah, no, okay. Um, I do have from Sherry a question about um, Evan, your color selection. Sure. <laughs> in those um, panels of everyday, um, yeah, objects the, the or first. activities. Yeah. What? Uh, what's... Oh, so just how did you come up with the different various colors when it ended up being one big composition? Okay. When you piece the pieces together. I think every time I do a patina, I feel like I don't know what I'm doing. <laughs> um, and so I, I, every time I, I, most of the time I try something new and and see what result I get. And um, with those, uh, some of them I liked more than others, but I, I was pleased at the end when I had them all out together that um, the 
it kind of worked for me. Mm-hmm. Was that, what does that answer? It? I, I didn't, I wasn't like specific. I just wanted variation for the most part. I didn't want them to all be the same. And I wanted them, uh, I, I was hoping the color would make them um, seem a little more modern than if they were all like a terracotta color or something. Um, Mark Walter has his hand up. Oh, so go ahead, Mark. Okay. Uh, do you hear me? Yes. yes. Okay, good. Uh, regarding ink for, well, for both of you, but uh, focusing on, on Taylor, what, what is the essence of ink? Uh, what 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 is the, the the minimum requirement or chemistry or whatever that that makes something an ink? Ooh, that sounds like a question I can't answer. <laughs> um, well, you ooh. found specific ink that was like more yeah resistant than others. Yeah, I've definitely um, there have been a few brands of ink. I'm blanking on the one that I bought in Italy because I left it there. Um, but yeah, a, acrylic ink seems to be working really well. And I've been using an airbrush lately on um, the ceramic work. So I've been using Golden's um, High Flow. So it's like a super, super viscous, like really easy to manipulate. And it it stays really flat, which for me, like a traditional paint would be thick and harder to sort of, uh, it doesn't like self-level, I guess. I don't know if that answers your question. Uh, well, uh, I don't know if it does either. <laughs> I, 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 <laughs> I, I'm kind of a, I get into the technical stuff oh. behind, behind the work that, that you know, be, behind art. And I'm a, I'm a sculptor, uh, I, and I've never, I don't paint or draw, so I, I don't use paints and inks and stuff. But, um, so I was just wondering what, you know, if, uh, well, like for instance, uh, we're familiar with India ink, and I think it's probably just a colloid of um, carbon particles. Uh, and it's deposited, and it's uh, and when it dries, it's it's there for good. It doesn't come off very easily. Um, and I wonder, it, well, that's a characteristic of at least one kind of ink. But um, and otherwise, when back in the days when we used to use fountain pens, we we used ink that sometimes was blue, uh, sometimes black. Um, and it was, it was very liquid. It didn't have much body to it and so on. But, you know, so it just, it just kind of struck me, you know, what is the essence of an ink? So I don't want to be, be leaguer the, the topic. <laughs> thanks, for, thanks for attempting to answer it anyway. Thank you. Thank okay. you, Mickey. Um, it's Jim. Jim. Hi, and Evelyn Taylor, thank you. That was a great presentation. Uh, wonderful to see you both and that you're both thriving. Uh, I'm curious, you both work in terracotta and marble, what your preferences are and why in the two different mediums? Clay and marble. Clay and marble. Sure. Do, do you want to start? Um, well, I mean, you can't beat clay because of the you can work both additively and subtractive. So I guess for certain things like for, yeah, for building, building bigger and being able to make those forms at home, clay is definitely what I would choose. But I don't know, with marble, there's just like, just the feeling of it. I think it, it can't be beaten in the luminosity. And so like, when it's thick or when it's thin and the way that you carve it, it just holds light in a way that I don't think any other material can like hold and reflect light. Mm. Yeah. Evan? I, I think, um, well, marble, marble is beautiful and, and durable. Um, it has its limitations for sure. It's very heavy. So if you're working remotely large, then it, it adds up quick. Um, and you need a place to do it. Um, but I love, I love the resistance of marble and 
yes, you have to be careful not to take off too much. Um, but then when you get down to the end, it's very, um, it, you can really have a lot of control over the forms you're getting. And with water-based clay, um, you can actually have a similar thing happen because the clay hardens as it dries. And then so you can work it differently at different stages. Whereas with oil-based clay, it's always the same consistency. And so you don't get that, have that happening. But oil-based clay is probably the, the cheapest way to work um, when you're casting in plaster because mm -hmm. it's all cheap materials, but plaster is like the dullest and like the least interesting finished material, I think. Um, and we just, we just got to kill them. So the terracotta thing is relatively new for us to have that capability. Um, but then you're limited by the size of the kiln, of course. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so the, they all have their, their various things. And like right now I'm, I'm working inside. So I'm using oil-based clay because it's the least messy. So in the, in the summer when it's nice out, that's a good time to carve marble. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Any other questions? Uh, I, ha I have a question. Hi, Charles. Um, hey, how's it going? <laughs> uh, that, those were both great talks. I learned a lot about both of your work and I was really interested in, although on the surface, the work seems very different, um, you're both influenced by history and then the flocking, you know, like it, I was wondering about um, ways that you inspire each other or what in, or ways that um, the other person's direction has influenced you. Well, yes. I think, yeah, <laughs> I mean, Though my work is not representational or figurative, I love looking at figurative work and actually prefer it. And so I guess I try to take some little elements of that and hide it in my work. And so Evan being primarily a figurative sculptor, I think, I don't know, there's definitely like sort of, a conversation line going through. Um, and we talk about our work, you know, with each other I, a lot. It's not like. Yeah, I think, yeah, I think we are both interested in and maybe inspired by um, a lot of the same things. And since we are both working in this traditional medium, um, it, by the nature of that automatically references all of these artworks of the past. And I think Taylor's approach um, definitely like flips it on its head a little more. Um, and mine is more um, directly uh, relating to those works. Um, does that answer? What's that question? <laughs> Kind of. I mean, we share but yeah, studio it, space too, so you're kind of like, you know, you're in it together. I know some artist couples, by choice, don't like to share a studio, don't want to share a studio, don't want help with, from the other person, like it's a very separate, and maybe part of that came from like, we met on Study Abroad, we sort of started to become artists, like professional artists like side by side. So I think that's sort of a, I don't know. It's definitely good to see each other's work. I think. <laughs> can, can, I, can I interject something? I think it's pretty interesting because having worked in Italy and knowing those studios, people work side by side all the time. Mm -hmm. You know, people from all over the world gather there. And so there's a, a tremendous dialogue really consciously or unconsciously between people's work. And you both came of age in that kind of studio atmosphere is one thing. The other thing is that although Taylor's work does not, it's not as directly referential to the classical as yours, Evan, Jeremy, when you talk about it, but basically it's like you're carving drapery, <laughs> do you <laughs> know what I mean? You're using all the same techniques. You need just as much skill 
Jimmy, to do those works. And it definitely draws from the classical tradition. And I think it is really fantastic that you have this dialogue with each other, do you mean, of the, um, the love of the classical in a different way and innovative way of interpreting it. Do you know what I mean? I think you're, that's a unique factor in your union in a sense, you know? So thank you so much for everything that you've shared. It's very, very exciting. Great to see awesome. you both. Thank you, Abby. <laughs> yeah. All right, last chance. Thank you very much, Evan and Taylor. We really appreciate it. We do have another talk that will be on March 25th with Oliver Shem, so. Oh, great. Um, you know, I hope you can all come back for that one and uh, be part of the, the series. Great. Well, thank you, Serena, and thank you, Carol. <laughs> yeah, Congratulations. Thanks. It was a fabulous talk. <laughs> Absolutely great. fabulous. Thank you. We, thank you. We did record it this time, so Ooh. hopefully uh, we saved it properly. <laughs> okay. Thank you. All right. Thank, thank you.